tonight on CBC Vancouver News. What we have here is Mr. Trudeau and Mr. Scheer arguing about who's worse for Canada. Political punch fest. Will tonight's federal leaders debate sway Canadian voters also? Everyone thinks that we're activists. I don't think that that's what we are. We are empathic individuals that are here because we care. Climate protesters block Vancouver's Burrard Street Bridge and... It can cause, for example, uh, brain damage, heart damage. STI outbreak, a spike in the number of syphilis cases in BC. This is CBC Vancouver News. Mr. Trudeau, you are a phony and you are a fraud and you do not deserve to govern this country. Mr. That's Mr. Bernier, only your role 6%, on this stage tonight only seems 6%. to be to say publicly what Mr. Scheer thinks privately. No. You do not need to choose between Mr. Delay and Mr. Deny. There is another option. <laughs> there is another option. It just wrapped up about a minute ago, the federal leaders debate. So will it shake up the election campaign and who, if anyone, came out on top? Good evening. Six federal party leaders have faced off in tonight's English language debate. It is the only major English language debate involving all the six leaders. So. Dan Burrett joins us now to have a look back at it. Dan, was uh, a lot of ground was covered tonight. Indeed, the environment, the economy, immigration, indigenous issues. This debate was, well, loud and sometimes chaotic with six candidates on that stage, as you saw many of them many times talking over each other. You couldn't really understand it, a lot of it, until the moderators stepped in. But here are some of the highlights. We're going to start with the two front runners: the Liberals Justin Trudeau and Conservative Andrew Scheer. Scheer responded to Trudeau's attack on the Harper government and its relationship with First Nations and building pipelines. I, I have nothing to learn from Mr. Trudeau, who fired the first Indigenous Attorney General for doing her job. She said that she would do politics differently, and you fired her when she did. And you want to talk about getting pipelines built? The, you've cancelled two pipelines, and the one you bought, you can't build. You've let tens of thousands of people in Alberta and Saskatchewan down, and you have failed, and you have failed to recognize that Indigenous communities so, are I, hurt by I, this as I well. Am Let's pivot to another big topic on immigration. NDP leader Jagmeet Singh went after Maxime Bernier of the People's Party of Canada, who has indicated he wants to slash immigration to this country in half. After a couple of minutes of this debate tonight, I think people can clearly see why I didn't think you should deserve a platform. The comments that you're making, the type of things you say, there's one thing to say that you disagree with somebody, that's fine. But when you incite hatred, when no, you incite I don't. Division, no, I don't. It's not you true. You cannot say that. You insult I'm just, a young I just girl want to have a debate. Ask about her mental stability. It shows a lack of judgment. Absolutely. You don't deserve a platform, and I'm happy to challenge you on that because your your ideas are hurtful to Canada. I now, access to abortion has also been an election topic, with various leaders clarifying their stances on the issue. Green leader Elizabeth May clashed with Jagmeet Singh and the Bloc's Yvon Blachette. We must be clear as all leaders, and you are not clear, Andrew, that we will never allow a single inch of retreat from the hard-earned rights of women in this country. Not one inch. This is... But, but this it would is me that you're open to working with Mr. Scheer. Yeah. Sure, I'm and your, your own MPs could come up with a law against abortion and you said that you will tolerate it. This no, is, I, I don't, no, I, this I, is I said we don't liberal allow anyone to tactic. run in our party right who doesn't hold playbook. a pro-choice they position. Are in okay, Dan, lots of back and forth as always with these debates. Any turning points or knockout moments? Well, if we're looking for a zinger, it was probably on the environment. Justin Trudeau and Andrew Scheer were fighting over the carbon tax. Watch what happens next. There's no Canadian that believes that they're going to be better off by paying a carbon tax. You have given a massive exemption to the country's largest polluters, and your plan the is already the experts, failing. The parliamentary budget it officer points out 80% of Canadians is, based are on better your numbers. off he under, had to trust our, the numbers you under gave our them. Uh, climate Nobody incentive. believes your numbers, Justin, because you, you do have not want to act Canadians. on climate yeah. change, Mr. Mr. Scheer. You, you were doing nothing. Just in case you were reversing the only point we ever had. You do not need to choose between Mr. Delay and Mr. Deny. There is another option. <laughs> there is another option out there. We are committed to a real plan that's going to take on the biggest polluters. It's going to take on the powerful interests because that's what we need to do. If we want to build a better future, what is your it's, going to ta it's going to mean taking on the powerful. That means we're going to have to you cut our emissions by more than half. 
So Canadians who watched this debate after two hours have a lot to think about, lots to sift through. It can be, you can be forgiven because there were six people, sometimes all of them talking all over each other at once. We'll have much more online and tonight at 11. Anita, Mike? Dan Burrett live for us tonight. Thanks, Dan. And hundreds gathered out at UBC this afternoon to watch the debate live on television. Leanne Young is there live tonight. Leanne, quite a big gathering. What was the mood in the room? That's right, Anita. Very engaged room here. I'm at the Liu Institute for Public Policy, one of a number of watch parties held on campus. There's another one that if you were watching the debate, you would have seen at the sub building. This one on the other end. More than 100 students packed in there, faculty as well. Standing room only, spending the afternoon taking in the debate. Maybe the pizza may have helped, but everybody in that room really interested in hearing what the federal uh, leaders had to say today. And I've got two of the students who are actually in that room with me right now. So I've got Victoria Kerr and Nabila Fareed. Both of them are undecided about who they plan to vote for uh, on October 21st. So we're going to ask them, get a little bit of your reaction of what you saw. So Victoria, first of all, tell me what were some of the highlights and misses that you found from this debate? Um, I think one of the highlights was the um, carbon tax plan placed forward by Bloc Québécois. I thought that was really unique and not really something that I'd heard put forward before. And had you considered Bloc Québécois prior to this? <laughs> not at all, okay. no. And for you, Nabila? I think uh, the discussions around climate change and taxing were really interesting and, and uh, well discussed. Um, some misses, definitely uh, some work, how, they'll, how they plan to work with the provincial government on post-secondary education affordability, as well as uh, more informed uh, Indigenous affairs and consultation. And what did you think about the format of the debate? There were um, a number of moderators and the timing was overall quite short. Was that enough for you to delve into some of those issues? I don't think that's enough time for them to go very deep into any of the issues. And I found that a lot of the time they were um, trying to, uh, I guess, put down one another. So I found it difficult to kind of figure out what it is, what their main um, points were. And yeah. And for you, Victoria, it's about this panel discussion that's taking place now yeah, that you're really absolutely. interested in because you want to dive deeper into that those totally. issues. And for you, Nabil? So I think even with the short time they had, um, it was not well spent because they kept getting sidetracked. Um, I think the moderators did a good job in bringing them back to the issues that needed to be discussed. Um, but I do think that more time is required to address the issues that are important. And obviously, when we do go and uh, cast your votes on October 21st, it's about your local candidate. But how important is looking at the federal party leadership for each of you when you're deciding who you vote for? It's very important to me because I think they have a lot of say in what goes on. Um, and I, actually, uh, Elizabeth, I voted for Elizabeth May the last federal election. And so I'm, it, I just think it's really important because I actually don't know I, if I've seen her very often in Victoria. I think I, I'm more, I, it's more important for me to see the, like federally what goes on. And for you, Nabil? So this is actually going to be my first time uh, being eligible to vote in a federal election. So I think it was really important uh, to have this debate. Um, I think it's important to consider Canada's international um, reputation as well as discuss the issues that uh, are within the federal jurisdiction. So overall, it was, it was great to watch and follow the federal election. Okay. Okay, final question. Did it uh, shift either of your minds on who to vote for? Yes or no? Yes. Uh, it gave me a little bit of clarity, but no. Okay, all right. So lots to think about from this October 21st when we uh, all head to the ballots. Back to you, Anita and Mike. All right, Leanne Young live at UBC tonight. Thanks. Okay, joining us, we have Shachi Curl uh, with Angus Reid and political scientist Gerald Byer live in our newsroom tonight. They've just finished watching the debate out here at our CBC studios. All right, Gerald, let's uh, start with you. Uh, what do you think? Any clear winner in this debate tonight? There's always more than one, but I think uh, Singh was good uh, in terms of uh, reacquainting himself maybe with people, being charismatic. Uh, but Trudeau wins by not losing. Uh, he wins by not really uh, being able to deflect some of the, the fight that uh, came to him uh, and not really taking a big blow. Different perspective on this. <laughs> uh, yes, I think both uh, Andrew Shear and Jagmeet Singh did themselves some service, some credit. You wonder what might have been uh, had they brought their A game like this way earlier on in their, in their leaderships. 
Uh, I don't think this was a good night for Justin Trudeau. He needed to be present. He has a lot of making up to do with that uncommitted left of center base and was largely silent and sidelined during this debate. So I think he had a lot to lose and he may have lost some of it. We'll have to look and see what, what the reactions are from Canadians who watched. Speaking of which, I think if there was a real loser in all of this, it was the audience. That debate format was very difficult to manage. Uh, and for people on the West Coast, uh, how many of them actually had the opportunity to view the whole thing starting at 4 p.m. local time? Okay, Gerald and Chachi, we'll hear more from you both in about 20 minutes on set to break down the full debate. Thanks. Thank you. And right now you're looking live at the Burrard Street Bridge in Vancouver. The span has looked like this pretty much all day. Yes, protesters blocking vehicle access, all in the name of bringing more attention to the global climate crisis. Deborah Goebel has more tonight with those taking part and their decision to take over a key route into the city. Are you ready to take a bridge? And take it they did. Most of the morning rush hour made it through, but by 9.30, about 100 protesters organized by the environmental action group Extinction Rebellion were blocking the Burrard Street Bridge from all vehicle traffic except emergency vehicles. And it's not going to be fun. Hmm. Are you late for work? Yes, I am working. <laughs> I'm trying to go to school. Are, are you having to do a long detour? Yeah, got to go use the Granville Bridge now. So. Is it kind of inconvenient? Yeah. It's over by the hour. But while the climate protesters say they're sorry for the inconvenience, they believe the impact of a climate crisis will be a much bigger inconvenience. We're here because we're in a climate and ecological emergency. Um, and millions of people around the world are already feeling the effects of that. This protest is part of a coordinated movement taking place around the world. In Canada, environmentalists are swarming bridges and viaducts in six cities, including the Johnson Street Bridge in Victoria. That's what we're here for. We're, our three demands, you know, we're, we're trying to get the governments to tell the truth, take action, and create a citizens' assembly. Having set up tarps and shelters mid-span of the Burrard Street Bridge, they say they're here for the long haul, and that includes some teens who've skipped school to be here. Seeing all these people, all you, like me, it's just amazing. Like, I'm speechless. So. It's really important for the younger generation, especially, to be represented because it's us who it's really going to affect. The protest has remained peaceful, so police are not interfering. The intention for bridges around the world, according to Extinction Rebellion, is to stay put for as long as possible. We're just getting started here, so we're going to make sure our message is heard today. And this is just the beginning. This demonstration marks the third worldwide climate protest held in Vancouver in as many weeks. Deborah Goebel, CBC News, Vancouver. And the protests weren't just held here in B.C. Activists targeted more than 60 cities for rolling protests over two weeks, including London, England. The Extinction Rebellion organization was launched a year ago in the UK and is spread around the world to bring attention to the climate emergency. Rallies also took place in Australia with hundreds of people staging a sit-in on a busy road where dozens were arrested. And demonstrations in New York included throwing fake blood on Wall Street. Okay, we want to take you to Richmond now, where a bizarre crash this afternoon has left one person badly hurt and a few police vehicles smashed up. Mira Baines joins us live now from the scene with more. Mira, what happened? Well, I'm at Gilbert Road and Blundell, and you can see some of the vehicles involved in that crash right behind me. There are also investigators here on the scene. They've been here for several hours. RCMP issued a news release just a little while ago outlining exactly what happened. Officers were called to the area earlier today after a patient who wasn't permitted to leave the hospital fled on foot. Police say they found the man had tracked him down, but he managed to somehow get into a police vehicle and drive away. The man then driving this stolen vehicle then collided with a civilian vehicle and an unmarked police vehicle and then a second civilian vehicle. A 
Eventually, police say the patient was arrested. The driver of that second civilian vehicle was transported to hospital with serious injuries. That was a woman that was injured in that vehicle. And one RCMP officer also received treatment for minor injuries. Now, as I said, traffic here has been tied up for several hours. Police are still on the scene. The Independent Investigations Office has also been called to the scene. We've seen some of the IIO officers here as well, and they're trying to determine whether police actions led to that uh, woman being injured in that second civilian vehicle. So a lot to investigate here, and there seems to be two scenes of where this has happened here in Richmond uh, along Gilbert Road. Anita? CBC's Mira Baines reporting live tonight from Richmond. Thanks, Mira. Dozens of protesters were out in force again at UBC today to show their concern about developments in Hong Kong. Victory will eventually belong to those who stand up for freedom and dignity. They wore masks in support of protesters in Hong Kong who have been defiant of their government's ban on face coverings. The ban there applies to what they call lawful and unlawful protests. Offenders face fines or up to a year in jail for covering their faces. A music teacher is facing charges after allegations of sexual offenses involving minors. 22-year-old Lamar Victor Alviar operates a North Vancouver music business called L.A. Music Studio, but it's alleged the sexual offenses took place in Coquitlam. Last August, RCMP arrested Alviar after a series of sexual misconduct allegations came to light. Alviar's charges range from possession of child pornography to sexual touching of a minor and three counts of sexual assault. He appeared in court today, and police say prior to these charges, he had no significant police history. The murder trial is now underway for the man accused of fatally stabbing an Abbotsford teenager at her high school. Gabriel Klein is charged with second-degree murder in the death of 13-year-old Letitia Reimer. She died in the stabbing at Abbotsford Senior Secondary School in 2016. Klein is also charged with aggravated assault involving a second student and has pleaded not guilty to both charges. Klein has been diagnosed with schizophrenia, but has been deemed fit to stand trial. There is an STI outbreak here in B.C. In fact, the number of people with syphilis has hit a 30-year high. And as the CBC's Mickey Cowan tells us, it's not just adults who are at risk. Overall in the province, we're at the highest rates that we've seen in over 30 years. More than 900 cases of syphilis last year. So we've seen a over five times increase and we're projected to see more uh, this coming year. And this year, for the first time in nearly a decade, two congenital cases, meaning syphilis that's passed on in pregnancy to a baby. Left untreated, it can mean severe consequences. A loss of pregnancy during pregnancy, it can also, if not treated at delivery, can lead to some permanent um, like lifetime implications for the children. Women should be tested both at the beginning and end of pregnancy. Regular testing for gay or bisexual men also encouraged. They made up 94% of syphilis cases in BC last year. So I think people um, are scared to come in and to really take care of themselves. The Health Initiative for Men says there aren't enough spaces where gay men feel comfortable getting tested. Their HIM clinics offer STI testing and counseling. It's not a big deal if you are diagnosed with syphilis that you can easily come in, get tested, go on treatment and uh, live a normal sex life. It's not clear what is causing the rise in syphilis cases. Gilbert says it could be more people getting tested or a change in sexual behavior like not using condoms. But whichever the case, he wants people to know syphilis is fairly easy to treat. A shot of penicillin and patients are on their way left untreated it can cause for example uh, brain damage heart damage all good reasons for more people to protect themselves and get tested mickey cowan cbc news vancouver the fall session of the bc legislature began today with this news from the leader of the green party i will not be seeking an another term as mla for oak bay gordon head and have asked the chair of the provincial council to start the process of electing a new leader for the BC Greens in preparation for the 2021 provincial election. Sorry. Weaver says it's time for another generation to take the lead and insists his decision has nothing to do with a recent health scare. Weaver says despite his announcement today, the Greens and NDP will continue to work together to accomplish their shared agenda. For his part, Premier John Horgan says he didn't expect that he and Weaver would become the friends they have.
I've enjoyed working with Andrew. We're going to continue working together. Much done, more to do. Uh, but I do understand, as someone who had a health scare of his own, uh, what that does to focus your mind. We're not any younger than we were when we started, and I respect his decision. NDP and Green Party Alliance was formed post-election, giving the NDP the support of 44 MLAs, the minimum required to have a majority of support in the 87-seat legislature. Weaver will remain as party leader until a new leader is chosen likely by next summer. Well, today was uh, a little bit dumpy in terms of rain. Dumpy. Dumpy. I, that, I guess an that's official that, term. That's or? the word I'm going to use. I felt <laughs> like it was dumping down on me and I was not a fan. Brett Soderholm, of course, is here now to tell us, I guess, how long that's going to last. Yeah, for me, I would classify this as just a classic Monday. The Monday vibes, it was dark, it was kind of rainy. It just really wasn't easy to get out of bed this morning, was it? Good news, though, it is not going to be sticking around for too much longer. We are going to be seeing quite a significant shift in our weather pattern throughout the next couple of days. But right now, just to show you, our temperature is right around the lower mainland, seeing some places with 13, 16, 15. We've been in and around that range all day, and that is pretty well seasonal for this time of year. One of the things, though, that is going to be changing, of course, is our wind right now. And in fact, in a very short while, we're going to be seeing wind gusts out of Victoria potentially exceeding 70 kilometers an hour. This wind is going to be shifting from the westerly direction that it is now to becoming a little bit northwesterly. And when you start to get northwesterly winds, well, that means the temperature is certainly going to have to change because that's going to be bringing in a lot colder air. So if I give you this look ahead to see what we can be expecting throughout the next little while tonight, our lows are going to drop down to 6 degrees. There is just a risk for showers there. Tomorrow morning and into the afternoon, there's still going to be that slight risk for a shower. No guarantee exactly when that's going to be, but our highs are going to be on the chilly side, 12 degrees or so, and by this time tomorrow night, clear skies, but definitely closer to 4 degrees. Okay, Brett, thanks. You're welcome. All right, you can watch this newscast and all of CBC's other content wherever you go. All you have to do is follow the free and download the free CBC Gem app. Yeah, CBC Vancouver also on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. You can follow us on all platforms or extra content you won't see if you're on TV. Paying for a flight upgrade, but not actually getting that upgrade. After the break, an Alberta couple is fighting to get a refund from Air Canada. Well, leaders' debates have long been a hallmark of Canadian elections since 1968, but what effect do they actually have on voters? Strategists will tell you they're critical to elections, and a lot of planning goes into them. Researchers, on the other hand, say while there is evidence they can change the outcome of an election, they often don't. Host of Power and Politics, Vashi Capellos, looks at the importance of the debate. Depending on who you talk to and what you read, just how useful they are and how much impact they can have, well, it's up for debate. Debates may be the most watched event during an election, but political scientists say the majority of the population doesn't tune in. And those who do are already pretty engaged in politics. A large part of that audience is just looking for confirmation. Now, sometimes they could be looking for a kind of reassurance. In fact, academics also point out many people get their information about the debate from how it's condensed in news coverage and on social media. So, in fact, if you look at debates that do seem to change things, a lot of the change unfolds as people learn about the debate in the news stream. Leader says he ran dial groups that showed people were turned off when exchanges became really negative and leaders spoke over each other. Whenever people start shouting at each other or shouting over each other, dial goes down, like people hate it. So you've got to prepare your people in a way that says, do not be shouting over each other. Academics say you'll often see the biggest effect on voters immediately after the debate, which is amplified by the next day's news coverage. We saw highlights of that debate. More often than not, it's a short-term change that is reversed. So it's like a pulse that then goes away. Even if there's no consensus on the effect debates have, experts do agree that they're good for the political process. Debates level the playing field in a way and allow um, parties who are maybe second, third, fourth, fifth tier to have an opportunity to engage with the leaders at the same level. 
Think about it like this. It's the only time you'll ever really see the leaders all together during the campaign interacting and actually talking policy. If you didn't have debates, then really all we would have is the even stagier and even more fake world of advertising, leaders tours and public appearances designed to create positive impressions. Uh, that video is an, just an excerpt of a longer explainer video, and you can watch the full clip on CBC News' YouTube page. In the meantime, we will have more debate analysis in about uh, five, ten minutes with Shachi Curl and Gerald Byer. They're going to be breaking down kind of the big moments of tonight, so stay with us. is fighting Air Canada over a flight upgrade they paid hundreds of dollars for but didn't get. So far, they haven't got a refund either. And as Rosa Marcatelli tells us tonight, a little-known rule says that's allowed. How tall are you, Rick? Six foot four. So it's no surprise then that this Air Canada ad caught Rick Brosato's eye. Are six foot four or four foot six? Get all the comfort you need. On a trip to Hawaii in April, the Borsados paid an extra $500 to upgrade from basic economy fare to comfort economy, which offers perks like seats with more legroom for the added cost. When the airline had to change planes and couldn't deliver, the couple says they were told they'd get a refund. Instead, they got 20% off a future flight and a $200 e-coupon. Just being treated like you're an afterthought, like you just... We, we have your work. money, and that's, sorry you weren't happy. Maybe we'll do better next time. Here's a discount. The airline points to a little-known rule. It's on page 30 of 116 pages of rules that passengers automatically agree to when they book. It's written by Air Canada for Air Canada, and in it, it says those services aren't guaranteed and there's no compensation. WestJet and several other U.S. airlines have similar policies. Unfortunately, that's the... Uh, the conditions by which the uh, Canadian Transportation Agency has allowed the airlines to promote their fares. Air Canada says it makes every effort to ensure that services are provided to the best of its abilities. And the no compensation rule was included for additional clarity. The couple and dozens of others have filed complaints with the Canadian Transportation Agency. They want the regulator to use its powers to force Air Canada to drop the rule. After hearing from Go Public, Air Canada offered the Borsados a full refund if the couple agreed to sign a non-disclosure agreement and drop their complaint. They refused. The rule has to change. Canada's new passenger protection regulations don't address the problem. You put your finger on one area for future improvement, which is the, the way that various uh, fare classes are advertised for the carriers to make clear what you're getting and what you're not getting and, and what your recourse is if you don't get what you're supposed to get. In its written response to the Borsados complaint, Air Canada says its rule is reasonable and that it had to change planes after the 737 MAX jets were grounded. The Borsados are now waiting to hear what the regulator decides. Rosa Marcatelli, CBC News, Calgary. Immigration and refugee policies were front and center in the last federal election. Coming up where the issue now sits with voters as they head to the polls.
Here are some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. Everyone thinks that we're activists. I don't think that that's what we are. We are empathic individuals that are here because we care. More than 100 climate activists took over the Burrard Street Bridge in Vancouver this morning. They are part of a worldwide demonstration demanding leaders take urgent action to prevent an environmental disaster. An RCMP cruiser was hit in a crash at Gilbert Road, south of Blundell Road in Richmond this afternoon. Witnesses say it looked like the cruiser was involved in some sort of pursuit with other police cars. One person has been hurt. Well, as you've been seeing, it is debate night in Canada. The debate just wrapping up a short time ago with all six major federal party leaders facing off. The CBC's Stefan Olivia Stefanovic has more on some of the standout moments. All six federal leaders had their elbows up as they tried to get their points across on a crowded stage, the most leaders ever featured in a debate like this in Canadian history. The first big moment came from Conservative leader Andrew Scheer, who launched a personal attack on Liberal leader Justin Trudeau. Scheer was criticized for coming out too timid in last week's French language debate, so it was important for him to come out strong right out of the gate with an English audience. And he did so by calling Trudeau a phony and saying that he wears a reconciliation and feminist mask. It was clear that Trudeau anticipated the attack. He is the incumbent, the only leader running on a record here. Trudeau hit Scheer back by criticizing the Conservatives for having a weak climate plan. And watching all of this back and forth between Scheer and Trudeau with great interest was NDP leader Jagmeet Singh, who interrupted several times, reminding the audience that there is another option here. Singh and Green Party leader Elizabeth May tried to present themselves as the credible alternative. But it was Maxime Bernier of the People's Party of Canada who took up much of the floor. Now, he was attacked by all his opponents for his controversial, controversial views on immigration, multiculturalism and the United Nations. But Bernier was unapologetic and he interrupted his opponents several times throughout this whole debate. And it was bloc leader Yves-Francois Blanchet who perhaps had the easiest ride. He is not running to be prime minister, and he focused all, the, uh, all of the debate solely on Quebec issues. The leaders will face off one more time before voters head to the polls in two weeks. They go head-to-head -head in the last French-language debate later this week. Olivia Stefanovic, CBC News, Ottawa. Okay, joining us now to break down the debate is Shachi Curl, Executive Director with Angus Reid, and UBC political scientist Gerald Byer. All right, a two-hour uh, debate uh, from four to six here on the West Coast. Mm -hmm. Not exactly prime time. What stood out for you? Not a lot. Mm. Uh, look, in terms of the debate format, uh, the number of moderators, the number of people on stage, I think we went into it knowing that there wouldn't be a lot of opportunity for leaders to actually have anything meaningful to say, which they rarely do in TV debates at the best of times. But this one was a real muddle. Uh, and uh, the free-for-alls, the, the timing of it, uh, the amount of, of leaders stepping over each other, I don't think did voters any good service. In terms of who came out of it a little bit better and who came out a little bit worse, uh, for Andrew Scheer and for Jagmeet Singh, they needed to look leaderly. They needed to uh, get some recognition. Uh, both of them did a good job in that sense of looking straight to camera in order to make that connection with voters. And uh, Andrew Scheer, right at the end, probably was missed, had a little note about, well, I'm going to prove you wrong on October 21st. That was a, 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 a stonesy move to make, as, as was taking the fight to Justin Trudeau through a lot of this debate. I think for those reasons, they came out of it looking better, particularly Mr. Scheer. Uh, for Mr. Trudeau, he had a lot of making up to do with voters. And uh, the fact that he was so sidelined and largely silent for long stretches of this debate, I don't think did him any favors at all. Okay, so Shachi feels like it was a little bit muddled. Do you think, Gerald, that there was anything that stood out that will change voters' minds? Um, I mean, I think there's not a lot that can change minds. I think a lot of people who are watching aren't looking to change their mind. They are looking for confirmation of, mm -hmm. of the people that they liked. I do think um, the emphasis that came from Trudeau on climate, uh, I think it was intentional. I think he's been looking for an issue like electoral reform was in 2015, where he can poach a little bit of that left of center vote. Uh, it's really essential to him to be able to do that. And I think making the, diff the distinction between himself 
and, and shear on that issue. You're going to rip up a climate change plan. You don't have a plan. You know, we can't do everything that the, green wants, the Greens want to do, but we can do something. We can do achievable things. All that sort of stuff, I think, helped a little bit. Uh, added to the muddle is, is Bernier's presence, I think. It was a bit of a muddle. Uh, he, he was kind of non sequiturs here and there. And, I, you know, I think a lot of people were critical that he would be involved in the debate. And it turns out that <laughs> there was reason to be somewhat critical, uh, although, you know, it could hurt the Conservatives because I do think there might be some Conservative voters out there who maybe weren't as familiar and say, oh, that's sort of the way I think. <laughs> they might, they might pick, people's party might pick up a few. And, and just quickly, uh, you, did anything resonate for British Columbians in, in this debate? I mean, we talked about the time zone, uh, that being one factor. I mean, notwithstanding the shout out to UBC, okay, <laughs> yay, but no, yay. listen, this is, this is a campaign and a debate series that I don't think serves Western Canadians particularly well. Uh, it's always hard to get eyeballs and attention with debates increasingly. There was a time 30, 40 years ago that this was the moment where uh, the country would gather around and be very engaged. Uh, the ways that social media and, and other things uh, sort of diffuse this makes the idea of a debate less meaningful. And when you do it at a time when very few people are focused on watching it and more focused on their end of day, getting home, getting the kids fed, I don't know who was served. Shachi, Gerald, we appreciate your perspective tonight. Thanks for joining us. Pleasure. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Now, Canada's immigration and refugee policies have been front and center since the last federal election in 2015. Whether it has to do with the welcoming of Syrian refugees, irregular border crossing, or backlogs in the immigration system, the topic generates much debate. Yes, Bell Puri now on where the major parties stand on immigration in this election, and whether the topic is even a major issue this time around. There's joy in the music, but it's trauma that unites refugee claimants who meet weekly to share their stories. Maybe in my conversations about who we are. Azar Al-Jalki is from Syria. He fled with his wife and children two years ago. We had more than 7,000 missiles on a small town. How Canadian voters cast their ballots on October 21st will impact future asylum seekers. I just want to think of the people that they are claiming are seeking the asylum. Why, I am, why am I seeking the asylum? Is it because I am coming from Five Stars Hotel or because I'm coming from uh, Boil of Fire? Before the civil war in Syria forced Vikan Majarian and his family to flee, he was a dentist, his wife was an engineer. In four years, they have become permanent residents, but neither is able to work in their chosen field. Refugee policy, in my opinion, it must be uh, choose not only bring all the refugees. They should do 50-50, in my opinion, because uh, Canada needs skilled people. The NDP wants to improve foreign credential recognition, possibly through practicums. It will cost about $60,000 to do each assessment and in fact they could have it as a loan to begin the program and they can pay back that loan and the program will fund itself. The Green Party has also talked about creating a system to evaluate immigrants' education. During the last federal election, the focus was on Canada's commitment to refugees and its willingness to increase numbers. But that was in the context of an international refugee crisis. The topic of immigration was divisive and somewhat explosive. This time around, not so much. It may be an extreme to say immigration is a non-issue in this election, but experts say it's not among key topics that will define it. It's not about immigration intake, but this notion of integration and what it requires and the role of the state uh, in sort of fostering either uh, a multicultural context or pursuing a more secular or homogenous context. Good luck. A dramatic increase, particularly in Quebec, in the number of asylum seekers who avoid official entry points has put much more attention on the safe third country agreement. It's a pact between Canada and the United States that allows each country to block certain would-be refugees. If you cross here, you will be arrested by the police. We cannot unilaterally as a country uh, enforce uh, our initiatives. That said, the numbers have come s severely down. Um, and we do encourage all immigrants to use the proper ports of entry. The Conservatives, meanwhile, simply promise to put a stop to people walking across the border. It's also a topic of interest for the People's Party of Canada.
We need refugees. And, uh, you, you know, with that being said, we just want to make sure that we're doing, giving it to the people who need it. So we're just going to put, like, a little fence. Azar al Jalki, meanwhile, says the greatest day of his life was when he arrived in Canada. He'll keep a keen eye on the outcome of the federal election and what it will mean for those who follow in his footsteps. <laughs> Bell Peary, CBC News, Vancouver. You are looking at a live shot tonight of the Port of Vancouver. Showers for much of the day and some gusty winds, but get ready for a bit of clearing. Brett has the details after the break. is back yeah it was monday for sure monday, monday vibes <laughs> really felt like it yeah. but uh yeah, we're happy already to... blue on the mondays we don't need the weather <laughs> i to know make it really we don't need any extra enforcement there i totally understand but uh by midweek hopefully it's going to be sunny and i think it's going to be a nice kind of crisp fall day as well so i'm going to get into that in the forecast but before we get there i want to show you the lovely Monday morning that was. I mean, many of us can probably pass on reminiscing on this particular Monday. Lots of rain. It was kind of cold. It wasn't really one that made you want to jump out of bed and go and tackle the day, did it? Certainly not for me. Now, for the next little while, we are going to be looking at a few spotty showers still going around the region. The overnight should largely be clear and free from them, but first thing tomorrow morning, I wouldn't be surprised to see a spotty shower or two in the metro region. But by the time that we wind down the day, we get into the late evening hours, things are going to be clearing up quite nicely, and they will subsequently be cooling down as well. This is all because of a very large Arctic front right now. It's going down from the Yukon and from the Northwest Territories, and it is just dropping temperatures across western Canada, we are looking at very clear skies as a result. This area of high pressure will form right over our province, and that is going to prevent any rain and any snow, really, from falling all the way over from the south all the way up into the north. So there is a silver lining in that. But these overnight lows are going to be on the chilly side. Even in Vancouver, by midweek, we could be seeing temperatures down around 2, maybe 3 degrees or so, and even for places on Vancouver Island, getting below zero at that. Of course, as a result, we do have a special weather statement in effect for some dropping freezing levels. Five to ten centimeters of snow is possible if you're traveling east of the metro region, getting into the interior. But as I said, this will all translate to some beautiful sunny skies for at least two to maybe even three days. And it's far too uh, in advance to be looking at next weekend, but that'll be the return of some more unsettled weather.
All right, Brett, thanks very much. You're welcome. Better access to prescription medicines has become a major issue in the federal election campaign. Coming up, results of a new study on the impact of free medication on patient health. I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. On the coast, Gloria Makarenko returns as host of Splash, Art Umbrella's signature art auction and gala on October 26th. Get your tickets today at artsumbrella.com. And CBC Vancouver's Dan Burrett is backed by popular demand at Richmond Hospital Foundation's Starlight Gala on October 19th. For more info and tickets, visit richmondhospitalfoundation.com. And for more, check us out online. Access to prescription medicines has become a major issue with this federal election campaign, with parties promising a range of solutions. So would free medicine actually help? Health reporter Cass Rusi takes a look at a new study on the impact of free medication on patient health. That was the albatross around my neck for the longest time because not having this made it very hard to uh, breathe. Beulah Jarvis is referring to a medication she needs to treat her asthma. At $180 per inhaler, she cuts corners to make it last longer. Jarvis takes other medications, including estrogen patches, items that are all part of her monthly budgeting. She's self-employed and medication often has to take a back seat. It was really stressful and there were a lot of things that I couldn't buy food-wise. As many as one in 10 Canadians like Jarvis struggle to pay for the drugs they need. Dr. Nav Persaud of Toronto's St. Michael's Hospital went looking for a solution to that problem. We have treatments for high blood pressure, treatments for diabetes, treatments for HIV AIDS, um, which can in some cases lengthen people's life expectancy by decades. Uh, and there are people um, walking around the city, walking around Canada, who don't take these medicines specifically because they can't afford them. Persaud and colleagues wondered what would happen if people who couldn't afford all their medications got them for free. Would they keep taking them and would their health improve? 
For their study, 786 patients were recruited from Ontario. One group received free medication, including drugs for high blood pressure, diabetes and HIV. The other group did not. They had the usual access to their medication, taking it about one quarter of the time. At the end of one year, the group who got their drugs free took them as prescribed 38% of the time, 12% more than the other group. Getting folks to take their medicines on time is a really complex challenger, a fin challenge. Financial barriers are one part of that. Um, when we take those away, things get better. Jarvis was part of this study and says for her, getting free medication improved both her health and her quality of life. Cass Rusi, CBC News, Toronto. Well, hundreds marched in support of the charity Autism Speaks, a long-running fundraising event in Richmond on Sunday. But not everybody was there in support. Deborah Goebel spoke with those who live with autism and who protested the annual event. Two at a time. Okay. As chapter leader for Autistics United in Vancouver, Vivian Lee is very clear. She is not a person living with autism. She is an autistic person. So you wouldn't call me someone with Chinese-ness? <laughs> that is real awkward, right? It separates my Chinese identity from myself. The message, she says, is autistic people don't need to be fixed. Their behaviors don't need to be suppressed because autism is a core part of their identity. Can I interest you in a flyer? So all across North America, chapters from Autistics United come out to protest the annual fundraising runs held by a group called Autism Speaks. They view autism as sort of a, a tragedy and we don't, we, we accept it as part of who we are. But then there are the marchers, most touched by autism in some way, many having turned to groups like Autism Speaks for help. Walking for a good friend of ours, um, David Renzullo. We have a friend who has a niece that has autism and this has done a lot for her. This is an unusual protest, people with autism protesting people who are trying to help people with autism. All I can say is that the information that, that they currently have is, is out of date and if they want more information we're happy to speak to them. The National Charity admits 15 years ago it did try to cure autism but now it's about research, awareness and support. But the protesters say it still sends the wrong message. There was also quiet hands, which I hate that phrase personally, like quiet hands means like don't, don't flap, don't stim, which, um, which is an important coping mechanism for uh, autistic people. Um, there's also sometimes we make like a noises, like a hum or uh, facial expressions, but really it's a part of who we are. Autism acceptance is the goal of Autistics United, but sometimes help is needed. It's one thing to tell parents, you know, we don't want you using those kind of therapies on your children. And then another for government saying, we're the, that's the only thing we're going to fund for your children. So you know, it's, it's a struggle. A struggle climate activist Greta Thunberg calls her superpower. But there's a saying in the autism world, you meet one person with autism, you've just met one person with autism. Deborah Goebel, CBC News, Richmond. Well, after the break, we are going to Port Moody to introduce you to a special sea lion research center. Stay with us.
Well, for more than a decade now, a research center in Port Moody has stood, serving as a testing ground to learn more about sea lions while making them some of the most highly trained animals of their species in the world. The Asian never stops talking. <laughs> <laughs> wow, this is Sitka, one of the four stellar sea lions at the Marine Mammal Research Centre. Trainers test and monitor their feeding and diving habits. Their research is key to helping shape the future of the endangered species in Alaska. But the centre's future is now in doubt. Funding will stop at the end of this year, meaning the centre will need to rely on donations and other sources to keep operating. That well, thing is huge. Yeah, they're big, and they, they like to eat. Wow. Big eaters. The breath issue? Yeah. How close were you? I don't know. I, I just, I may have heard that. I don't want to know. Uh, well, hopefully they can get that, because it's uh, they do good work there. Important so it'd be nice work. to see the, uh, the funding continue. For sure. Mm -hmm. That's it for tonight. Dan is here at 11 o'clock after the National with your next local news. Have a good night.